Sweet, Emma. Okay, welcome everybody. I'm Vivian Shaw. I'm a URI Master Gardener. I'm the class of 2014. I have over 900 volunteer hours. Uh, I'm getting close to being a Hall of Fame uh, Master Gardener, which means I've had will have over a thousand hours. Currently, besides doing presentations, I also work on the hotline, which we will talk about. And currently, I am the um, educational services co-coordinator. I'm in charge of the hotline and soil testing for the entire state. So welcome, everybody. Um, if you have a question that you would like immediately answered, you can uh, interrupt me. Uh, otherwise, if you jot down your question, I will stay on as long as you're interested in asking questions. I'll keep staying on. Uh, Master Gardeners are part of Cooperative Extension. Every state has a land grant college. They, those were established in 1914 and every state has a master gardening program. This year, we cycle through these um, themes. This year, we're working on food systems and agriculture. We're really trying to encourage people to grow their own food. So Master Gardeners, um, there is over 600 of us. And the new class of Master Gardeners, there's 130 of them that are going to graduate uh, next Wednesday. Um, and then they'll become interns. They'll have to do 50 hours of volunteer work before they become uh, full-fledged Master Gardeners. But um, we do a lot of gardening. We also have the hotline. We do, we are mentors for school gardens. When it's not COVID, we do a lot of workshops in the community. We have demonstration gardens all over the state and we do soil testing. We're doing kiosks, virtual kiosks. It's uh, Saturday mornings. Uh, it's kind of like an old, ra old radio show where you call in and ask your questions. And uh, again, non-COVID times, we have a lot of educational events, uh, but we are happy to be here doing presentations virtually. So why do you wanna do vegetable gardening? Well, there's a lot of reasons to start. You can connect with your natural world. The main reason I do it is I am in control of my own food source. Uh, it improves your soil, gives you some hands-on skills, and you can restore native plants. But it also should be fun if it's a chore and you feel like, oh, this is just a lot of work, hard work, and it's not really very fun and we never need more chores, do we? So just a little preview of what we're gonna to learn today. You're gonna to learn how to grow vegetables and herbs. You're gonna uh, find a lot of information to support you in your gardening. If you're just new to vegetable gardening, you, I'm gonna recommend you start small. We're gonna talk about site selection on where to find a space and make a plan. I'm gonna encourage everyone to test their soil. You do need a few tools. I'm gonna go over whether you wanna plant seeds or, veg or transplants. And once you get your garden over, you gotta deal with the pests. I'm gonna encourage you to visit your garden daily. And we're also gonna talk a little bit about uh, container gardening, just in case you don't have room for a garden. So if you're, you're new to vegetable garden, I'm gonna recommend starting small, a 30 foot square, 30 foot square, 30 square foot garden is the best place to start. That's a four by eight raised bed. Or if you're gonna to decide to uh, dig out your, a piece of your yard, that's a, a four by eight. You wanna make sure your garden is narrow enough that you're not gonna walk in it if you have a really big garden um, and you want to try a big garden, that's perfectly fine. I would highly recommend making distinctive pathways. The worst thing you want to do is start trampling around your plants and compacting your soil. 
So a uh, four by eight garden, you can buy kits these days that you just have to put together and you have a four by eight garden, or there's a lot of do it yourself uh, ways to do it on YouTube. So plants need sun, water, and nutrients from the soil. So when you're planning your garden on where is it gonna be, you need to find, know where there's enough sunlight, what's the condition of your soil, and where is the water. Water weighs about eight pounds a gallon, and um, if it, you have to be carrying eight pounds of, uh, a per gallon pretty far to your garden, that's probably not a good spot for it. So you want to make sure you have at least six hours of direct sunlight. That's where you're going to get your energy for your garden. You want to make sure you're outside the root zone of trees because the tree roots will be competing for the nutrients and the water of your garden. You need to make sure you're at least 10 feet from a building just because uh, in case you have lead contamination and you wanna be protected from some really strong winds. So I live on a Quidnick Island and we have some serious wind here. Um, so you wanna make sure your garden is pretty protected. You wanna make sure your garden also drains and is fairly level. It'll be a little bit easier to um, work the soil that way. You don't want to put it in a low spot in your yard where uh, water just settles there. So you're gonna, the first thing you're going to do is, well, let me go, go back one second. Um, so there's two ways to do this. So the left-hand picture, they rototilled part of the yard, and then they set these. These are probably four by four raised beds. And they're going to fill those raised beds with with soil that you buy. Now you can do that, that's perfectly fine. Um, it's a little bit more expensive if you're buying soil, but if your soil is not very good, then that might, that might be an option that you might wanna choose. The picture on the right is where you rototill the soil or hand dig the soil and then um, put, place your a raised bed right over the top. So that's two ways to do that. So now we're going to prepare our garden bed. Well, you want to remove or turn under the existing plant. So you either want to rototill or you can do it by hand with a pitchfork. Uh, you want to loosen the top layers of the soil with a, with a pitchfork, make sure they're all nice and loose. Uh, you're going to add amendments and fertilizer in accordance to a soil test. We're gonna talk about soil testing. Um, you wanna add some compost, at least an inch of compost and work that into the surface. Now I highly recommend for watering, if you can, to set up a soaker hose. This picture has the soaker hose. You run the soaker hose in there and then you plant your plants near the soaker hose. That way, um, you're just turning on the water and letting the water, uh, letting it soak through the, through the garden bed itself. This, I find, is the most efficient way to garden. You're watering the base of the plants at the root zone. You're not getting any of the leaves of the plants soaking wet, which we're going to talk about too. You want to smooth all that surface cover it with mulch. You can either cover it, you can either cover it with mulch before you plant or after you plant. It's up to you. I do highly recommend that you test your soil. So um, you really need to know what the pH of your soil is. And what is pH? Well, pH is the measurement of the acidity or basicity of of your soil in a liquid solution. So pH range is between zero and 14. So seven is neutral. Zero to 6.9 is acidic. 7.1 to 14 is basic. Most vegetable plants prefer soil that's around 6.5 to seven. The pH values common in Rhode Island are less than five. 
So before before below six, you're having a trouble. Uh, the plants have trouble getting nutrients. So let me just tell see what that it means. So you're walking uh, downtown in Providence. You're getting kind of hungry, and you play. You pass a chocolate shop. Now that chocolate, all those chocolates in the window, they just look fantastic. And you're really hungry and you'd love to get, go in and get some of those chocolates. You can see them through the window, but you can't get them. And the store is closed and you can't get them. Well, that's kind of what happens with plants and nutrients in the soil when your pH is either too low or too high. In Rhode Island, most commonly it'd be too low. Your plants need the nutrients from the soil. However, the pH is too low and your plants cannot absorb the nutrients from the soil. Now there's a lot of biochemistry that goes with that. And it, we're talking about cation and anion exchanges and it's a kind of a technical thing, but the, the main thing is your plants would not be able to absorb the nutrients. So that's why you need a soil test. You can get a free soil test from the master gardeners and I'll show you that in the next slide. And if you are starting a brand new um, garden uh, I would, and you're gonna use your own soil, I would highly recommend a soil test, a full soil test from either University of Connecticut or University of Massachusetts. They'll do micronutrients, pH, and in Providence, especially, I would uh, you would need that for a lead test. Make sure that there's no lead in the soil. Um, they'll tell you, and we will tell you if we give you a free pH test, whether you need to fertilize or add lime, add compost. So I'm going to leave this this slide up for a little bit. The top is uh, about the. Uh, gardening environmental hotline. If you have any questions, any kind of garden questions, either about plants, vegetables, pests, uh, you can email us at gardener at uri.edu. Again, that's gardener dot at uri.edu. They, we have uh, master gardeners working on the hotline Monday through Friday. And we're here to answer any of your questions. You can take pictures, you can email us pictures, and we'll do our best to um, answer any questions you have. Also, um, I highly recommend you visit our website, uri.edu slash master gardener. Um, there's a, a lot of information on there. Uh, if you, uh, you can look up soil testing and it'll give you, it'll explain to you how to take a proper soil sample. There's a lot of resources uh, under the resource section where you can uh, watch videos or learn about native plants or learn about pollinators. So um, those are important uh, websites to use. Now, because of COVID, we had to change our soil testing dramatically. Maybe you knew of places where you could go easily on a weekend and get a soil test. And uh, last year we had to shut down completely, but this year uh, we were allowed to do some contactless uh, soil testing. So there's four locations there, depending on where you live. Um, uh, for you, those of you who live in Providence, the Roger Williams Botanical Center is Saturday mornings from 10 to 2. You can come in, fill out a form, drop off your soil sample, and uh, someone will uh, collect that and test your soil for you and contact you with your results. Uh, if you live a little bit north of there, you can go to Pawtucket. Um, or if you're um, a little bit south, you can go to the Matt Mellon Center. And I'm not sure if any of you live on uh, the east side of the state, but it's at Prescott Farm. 
So we're really trying really hard. There are teams of people working at each of these sites. We're working really hard to try to accommodate everyone. Um, this has been something, because I'm in charge of soil testing for the state, this has been something that I've been working on all winter to try to make this service available. And you can get a soil test. Uh, you can drop off your samples every day of the week except Thursdays. So we have our uh, sites selected. We have we have our uh, soil prepped. We had our soil tested. We did what we were uh, recommended. Whether we needed lime, whether we needed um, other things for our soil. So we've done that. Now we need to make a plan on where, what kind of where we're going to put our plants. So we need to know where's the sun. So we can always create shade by putting taller plants in front of, of uh, other plants, but we can't create sun. So that's why we want to, when we choose our site, we need to make sure we have plenty of sun. Again, where's the water? Can I get a hose directly to, from the water to my garden bed and run it with a soaker hose? Or am I gonna need to uh, carry water? Where are the trees? Are we, am I gonna have shade some parts of the day? Do I need to plant some of the plants that need more shade near where the trees are? Where are nearby buildings? Is that gonna cause some shade? Um, what's our sowing and harvest se sequence? So uh, for instance, tomatoes, plants can be very large and uh, lettuce and they need lots of sun, but lettuce, does not need as much sun and really likes it more shady. So maybe I can plant my lettuce in between my tomato plants and they'll get the shade that they need. So that again goes with the heights and shade rotation. So uh, maybe I wanna do some radishes that, that don't grow very tall and maybe I wanna plant the radishes won't take very long and maybe I can plant something else thereafter. Am I going to use raised beds? Are we going to, am I going to um, fill those raised beds with soil that I bought? Am I going to rototill and then fill the raised beds? Uh, so it's really important to make a plan. So we talked a little bit about what plants need. The soil is the number one. The, they, it's going to need the micronutrients and structure for the root systems. You want that will happen with compost. So a lot, most of the soil in Rhode Island is either silty loam or sandy loam. Both of those um, can be can become quite compact. So your compost will really help loosen the soil in the subsoil. We want to make sure there, there's uh, enough air. We don't want to drown them and we don't want compacted soil. We want to make sure we're watering our plants at least an inch to two inches per week. I highly recommend you water in the morning. So uh, some of the mistakes that people make is they come home from work 5, 5.30 and they set out a sprinkler in the middle of their garden and they start watering. And plants uh, get wet about six o'clock at night and they stay wet all night long. Now you might think, but you know, Vivian, it rains at night too and we do have plants that get wet at night. That's true, but it's not every day. So um, if, you're, if your leaves and stems are getting too wet, and staying wet overnight, um, you're gonna be calling the, me at the hotline by August and saying, what are these spots on my leaves? What is this white film on my leaves? And you're gonna start having fungal problems. When you water in the morning, you wanna water at the base of the plants, first of all, and you wanna water in the morning. So if you do get the plants wet, they have all day to dry. That's why I highly recommend the soaker hose method, you plant, you're just, it's a drip method. You're just wet watering the roots of the plants and you're not getting anything 
all the leaves wet unless it rains. You wanna make sure your plants get plenty of fertilizer. I highly recommend um, a liquid fertilizer that you can do once a week at quarter strength. So most fertilizers, they say, put it on once a month. I'm gonna give you a tip here that you wanna do instead of whatever it says, a cup a gallon, half a cup a gallon, you wanna divide that by four and then do it once a week. More fertilizer is not necessarily better. You wanna follow the recommendations on the package of the fertilizer, on the bottle of the fertilizer, but you wanna divide it by four so that you can do it once a week. So timing is important in planting, in planting and um, we're gonna talk more about that again. You're gonna to need to weed. There's, there's no way around that. You're gonna to have to do some weeding and you're gonna to have to keep an eye out for pests. What you want is you want the good partnerships with all the worms and the microbes that come from the co compost that are breaking down organic material and making your soil nice and loose. You are gonna need a few tools, spade, fork, rake, trowels to plant, um, some sort of a cultivator to uh, weed with. You might need a hand pruner to keep things a little bit under control. Uh, again, I rec highly recommend a soaker hose, gloves, I recommend a rain gauge too. So uh, I live in Middletown and Friday we got an inch and a half of rain. Now I'm not really, I'm not really planting anything right now. So uh, that doesn't really matter, but I, I do keep track for my perennials also. So I got a rate, my rain gauge set up. We got an inch and a half. I'm good. Uh, the perennials should be happy for a whole week that way. I highly recommend you keep uh, a notebook and pencil, keep a journal. What did you plant? Where did you plant it? When did you plant it? And how did things grow? Did they do well? Did they not do well? Was that not a good spot? What fertilizer did you use? How often did you use it? Is um, all, these, all this information uh, and you save it from year to year uh, is important information on, on uh, so for future planting. And I, I, would, I take pictures of my garden, you know, how does it look? Does it, um, how did things do? I take, you know, maybe a picture in the early spring, in the middle of the summer when things are looking really lush and uh, later in the fall. All right, we're, we've got our garden prepped, site chosen. We've made our plan. We have everything. Now, what are we going to grow? Before you plant, you want to ask yourself five questions. First of all, the most important thing is what do you like to eat? You want to make a list. You want to, um, you know, are we just going to pick things for dinner or you're going to can it and freeze it? This is a lot of lettuce here. I don't know how many people, are, uh, this is would be a lot of lettuce. You would need quite a big family to eat all this lettuce. How much time do I have to tend the garden? Um, it should be, again, it should be fun, not a chore. Uh, do I, uh, you don't want to be growing plants that you need to fuss over. Again, we want six hours of daylight for fruit bearing vegetables and you need at least four hours for greens. How much should I plant? Figure out what eight running feet will yield and don't over plant. So, Lynn was sharing with her the story of her uh, zucchini. She had two zucchini plants and she was inundated with zucchini. Um, again, that's what the journal is helpful for. You know, you, you plant two zucchini plants and you got 30 zucchini. Well, maybe next year you need to plant only one zucchini plant. I had the same issue with that too. One year I planted four, four zucchini plants and I was giving zucchini away to the entire neighborhood. Um, how much space do I have? If you only have a small space, you want to avoid sprawling uh, things like pumpkins, watermelons, melons, winter squash. Um, I highly recommend that if you can uh, put in a trellis, 
especially to grow um, cucumbers. Cucumbers actually do very well growing upright vertically on a trellis. It's easier to pick the cucumbers. Uh, also cucumbers tend to, uh, their leaves at the end, towards the end of the summer, tend to turn white. That's uh, something called powdery mildew, which is uh, a little bit too much moisture. Uh, cucumber leaves are pretty large. So if they, if they stay wet, they develop this downy mildew. If you have them growing upright, on a vertical trellis, they um, they get more air, and they that you really can cut down on the downy mildew. Okay, what are we going to plant now? Are we going to start from seed? Seed is definitely less expensive. You can get more variety. I don't know if anyone has uh, tried ordering seeds this year. You need to start ordering them. You get the catalogs December, January. I know everybody is uh, doing a lot more gardening these days, which is a great thing. Uh, but I've talked to other master gardeners that they just didn't get the seed varieties that they normally did that catalogs were already sold out by January. But mostly you can get a, a lot more variety when you buy your own seeds. You can determine when the germination is, and uh, usually um, you're in control of the insect and disease problems because you're starting actually from seeds. Uh, and there's less risk of spreading disease and insects with seeds. I, um, you can't see the room I'm in right now, but I'm in the I'm in the, a spare room that I've turned over to a storage room and my gardening room. So I have um, several bins of seeds here starting in this room. Uh, so I like, I just think it's really good feeling to start from seed. I to go from a seed to harvest. It just makes, gives me a lot of satisfaction. So I start my own seeds. Start doing seeds indoors is a kind of an art to that. And that's a whole nother uh, talk <laughs> on seed starting. Or do you want to use transplants? Transplants make sense for busy gardeners. Um, you know, some you may not have the space to uh, grow seeds. I've only been starting my own seed uh, starting in the last few years. I mean, this room used to be my son's bedroom. So he's an adult now, he moved out. So now it's my growing room, but otherwise I wouldn't have this. Um, they're all ready to plant. You know, you have, um, you don't need to thin out. It's a lot less work. I find it fun. I like doing starting seeds indoors, but other people, uh, you know, can be a chore. Uh, I just want you to look at that transplant. Uh, if you can see the roots there on the bottom, if you're going to transplant a tra if you're going to transplant and plant that directly, the one thing I want you to be aware of is you need to loosen that um, that root ball there very carefully, very gently loosen that up. A lot of one of the mistakes people make with transplants is they pull that plug out of a six pack and then just stick it in the ground. And if the, especially if the roots have been wound around quite a bit, um, the plant doesn't really release those roots well into the soil. So you wanna gently break those up very slow, very lightly, very easily um, so that the roots can spread. So if you're planting with seeds, um, the seed packets, carry all the information you need. So here's a package of cucumbers. Uh, you wanna make sure, so let's just, look, let's just look at this package. It wants full sun, at least six hours. You're gonna have 58 days to, to harvest. And that's 58 growing days. That's 58 days of over 70 degrees. That's what that means. Um, you're going to plant that at a depth of one inch. So you're going to do that. Um, so the general rule for a seed is you want to plant it down deep enough. Tight. The depth of the hole is to be twice the width. 
So that's what you're going to do. But the seed packet will tell you exactly. And um, when it says to thin, you want to uh, put in uh, two to three plants for a group of plants. So um, the map there is um, shows us in the green and it's May to July because um, we need to have at least past frost. I'm gonna uh, show you a planting calendar that's on the next slide. Uh, but you, you want to plant your seeds, give them enough space. Um, again, it should say, yeah, it says on the package, you wanna sow them about three inches apart in hills and you wanna make your hills four to six seeds about three inches apart in a hill and you wanna make them 36 inches, each hill 36 inches apart. Again, I would um, highly recommend you plant those hills if you can uh, build a trellis so that they can go vertically. Uh, you wanna keep the soil moist. You wanna plant those seeds. You want to uh, firm the soil on top of the seed, water, water them after you uh, plant them. You wanna keep the seed, the soil moist until the seed sprouts and you want to get make sure the seedling takes hold. If you're purchasing transplants or seedlings, I highly recommend you purchase them from a knowledgeable grower. I was at Home Depot on Monday and they had tomato and pepper plants outside. Tomatoes and peppers need at least 70 degrees. 65 degrees, they're okay, but they, they like it really, really warm. Now here they were outside ready to buy um, on Monday. And of course we all know about the cold and the snow we had on Friday. So I would never buy tomatoes or peppers or I don't buy any vegetable seeds, vegetable plants from a, a place like um, Home Depot because you don't know how long they've been out there and where they came from. So this is the Rhode Island planting calendar. Lynn, I sent you an email earlier in this, this week, uh, I'm sorry, earlier today to uh, send this planting calendar to everyone. It has two sides, goes from asparagus to turnips. Um, and I just wanna review this a little bit. So asparagus, you wanna plant crowns, CR or crowns, and you wanna plant them on April 15th. So this is, how this works. So S means direct seed in the garden. So you can look down for um, cucumbers, you can direct seed them. Um, uh, the I means starting them indoors. So if you're going to uh, say for instance, eggplants, you wanna start them indoors, you can start them in March and then transplant them in June. So the T is for transplanting your seedlings that you started indoors, outdoors. So this is a very handy thing. It was developed in 2019 by um, uh, people at the Cooperative Extension at URI. And uh, we pass this out all the time and share this on the hotline all the time. So it really helps you um, to know when to plant. Uh, again, the day, the column of the days till harvest, days till harvest means days of over 70 degree temperatures. So when do you plant outside? Well, timing is crucial. You need to know when the last frost is and the first frost. So the last frost is October 15th usually, and uh, usually the, the first uh, frost I'm sorry, the first frost is October 15th and the last frost is May 15th. So my dad always said you never plant anything directly outside that was a fruit bearing plant um, till after Mother's Day. And we're actually recommending even at May 15th. And sometimes it's even later. Two years ago, we had a really cold, rainy, rainy uh, May. I did not plant things till Memorial Day weekend. It was just really, really cold. Uh, hardening off is a weaning process and I'm gonna go into detail of hardening off. You need to really wait till the night, te night temperatures are above 50. So, I mean, we're still having night temperatures in the 30s. This week, it's supposed to be a little bit better, night temperatures in the 40s, 
but it's still way too cold to be planting a lot of things outdoors. And we're gonna talk about season extenders and what that means. So hardening off is a weaning process where you're taking your, your plants from either inside your house, if you've started them indoors, or if you've bought transplants from a, a gardening supply store and they've been in a greenhouse. One of the biggest mistakes that people make is it's a early May, late April, early May. It's a gorgeous 70, 75 degree day. They go to their local garden shop, they buy plants, They've been in a greenhouse, they buy them directly from a greenhouse and put them directly in the ground. And then we have uh, night temperatures in the 50s. The plants just, they don't do anything. They're just like, uh, we don't like, I don't like this. My roots are cold, I'm cold, I'm not gonna grow. And they, then people go, oh, well, we just need more fertilizer. So they'll double the fertilizer and now you've got burnt plants that are not gonna grow. So you want to, the hardening process takes at least, a, it says one week here, but I, I always use two weeks. I've even used three weeks. You need to take your time to do this. What it means is you're going to take your plants, either you bought them at a garden supply store or you've grown them indoors, and you're going to take them outside on a warm day, a little bit in the shade, and then you're going to bring them in at night. And then each day, you're going to do that a little bit more. So you might want to start with, you know, an hour, hour and a half. It's a beautiful sunny day. It's 65, 70 degrees. And then you bring them in. And then the next day, you do maybe two hours, two and a half hours outside. And then you're going to bring them in. And you're going to keep doing that um, until they've been outside for a good seven, eight, nine hours. But, you know, it's spring in Rhode Island, so you never know what we're going to have. So we have maybe a 60 degree day and then we have a 40 degree day. Well, on the 40 degree day, just don't put them out. You know, they just um, they just don't like the, the wind and they don't like it really, really cold. You want to reduce the frequency of water. Don't stop watering. You, want, you don't want the plants to wilt, but you don't want to really be um, soaking them through. Um, you can use a cold frame, this picture. These are getting very popular. These like little tent things with the plastic around them that you can zip up and you can put hardened things off in there. Um, or these hoops that you can see in the bottom picture with frost nets over them. So plants die because of frost not necessarily because of the cold, depending on the kind of plant. So surely tomatoes and pepper plants don't do well in the cold, but things like uh, greens, Chinese greens, lettuces, carrots, radishes, bok choy, kale, um, they, they don't mind the cold, but they can't tolerate the frost. And this is what I call, this is what we call a season extender. So you can buy these hoops, and you can get a frost net. I used to work at a, a community garden here in Middletown where we had a hoop house and we did winter gardening. It was uh, quite remarkable after, actually. Each uh, bed was very narrow so that these hoops go right, o right over the whole bed. And we put these frost cloths on them. And overnight, uh, the frost would collect on the frost cloth. It's, it's kind of like a, it's almost like a cheesecloth. Um, but they're specific frost frost cloths, and the frost builds on the plant on the cloth overnight, and then during the day when it's warmer. Again, we're in a hoop house, and um, when it's warmer, the frost melts, and we didn't even have water in those hoop houses, and it would water overnight. It would water in the I'm sorry during the day, and it would water the plants. So we didn't even water the plants. Um, and this can be done actually in the spring too. If you have plants that you planted, you want to cover them. You got some lettuce growing and you got some cold days in May. We might need to cover them um, if you got some cold nights in May. It, it happens. It also can be an extender in the fall if you're trying to um, grow again 
uh, something like lettuce or kale in the fall, and you want to extend that maybe uh, past uh, October and still enjoy your lettuce and your kale and your Swiss chard, you can still do that. Um, hardening off, uh, after hardening tomato plants, they can tolerate a little bit of frost once they've hardened, but plants, uh, tomato plants, if you plant those tomatoes, peppers, the warm, the really warm loving plants, and they haven't been hardened off properly, and uh, that's where plants uh, will die. So take your time when hardening off. You're going to need some fertilizer. Again, we don't want to over fertilize. And this is what I recommend one time per week with quarter strength of a liquid fertilizer. So I use a fish emulsion. I'm an organic vegetable gardener. So I use a fish emulsion. I know some people really hate that. It smells terrible, but I use a fish emulsion in vegetables and Osmocote for flowers. So Osmocote is a slow release fertilizer. You sprinkle it on and it lasts about three, month, three months. Uh, nature source plant food is also a, a good um, organic fertilizer. And again, quarter strength once a week. You're also gonna have to uh, keep track of your plants um, and where are the pests? What's getting in, what's chewing? Uh, personally, I battle a lot of rabbits. Uh, my property backs into some open space. It's um, actually a, a stream that runs through the back of my property and um, it has to be kept natural. Uh, it's a DEM easement and um, the rabbits just love living in there. So I battle rabbits all the time. I do not plant any uh, lettuces or greens uh, in my vegetable garden, I do all of that on a, uh, on pots on my deck because the rabbit, it would just be rabbit food. So you wanna uh, keep your eyes open. We wanna focus on what is the pest. Sometimes just removing the pest by hand is best. So the picture on the right, that's a tomato hornworm. They're, they're very camouflaged, but you keep an eye out for them. You can um, pick those off and get rid of those um, very easily without uh, using any pesticides. So uh, if you're really having some trouble with some pests, I highly recommend you use the hotlines, take some pictures of them, uh, send them to the hotline and the hotline staff can um, help you identify the pest. And it could be that it's a beneficial pest. Maybe you have some aphids or something and you got eight ladybugs, you're seeing a lot of ladybugs. Well, the ladybugs are not a problem. They're eating the aphids. So maybe we, you, uh, you don't really have a pest problem. So um, the hotline is there for your information. You wanna spend time in your garden each day. You wanna observe things, adjust things. Are things too wet? Are things too dry? It's always, um, I think, really interesting to see what's, what's budding, what's uh, flowering, what's, what's producing, how big is this plant getting? And it's just a, a haven for you and the animals and the plants. So uh, maybe some of you live in Providence in an apartment or something and you don't have a lot of room. Uh, consider gardening in containers. So I, I do actually quite a bit of gardening in containers. Uh, again, I have quite the rabbit problem. So I do uh, all my herbs and all my lettuces in containers on my deck. This is um, a three-tiered shelving unit and there's 15 plants right there. And there's some tomatoes up above, there's some peppers on the right, there's lettuce and there's I'm not sure exactly what that herb is, but it looks like some sort of herb. But um, container gardening is becoming really, really popular, especially for people who live in cities. And I, again, I, I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about this briefly, but there's a whole nother presentation on just container gardening. You can use any kind of pot or bucket as long as it has drain holes. If you can drill, if it doesn't have drain holes and you can drill some in there, 
that's fine. Otherwise, um, I do not recommend using any kind of pot or bucket without a drain hole. Uh, if we have a hard rain and it's, you're gonna have uh, wet soaking roots um, that will eventually rot and kill your plants. You want to use a soilless potting mix. You want to have, you want to buy a mix that's specially made for containers. The last thing you want to do is dig up some soil out of your garden and put it in a container. Um, soil, we're going to talk about the soilless mix in the next slide, but it needs to be very light and airy. Think about the root system of a plant. If you have um, a plant, say a pepper plant, um, it's going to have quite quite an extensive root system. And if you're in a container, the root, roots don't have a lot of room to spread out. But in your garden, they would have much more room to sp spread out. That's why you need a soilless mix that's not compact. It's very loose and airy. There's a lot of varieties now of vegetables and herbs that do well in, cont in containers. Um, for instance, cherry tomatoes is um, tomatoes are really, really large plants that have a quite a deep root system, but there are special varieties of tomatoes that are specifically made for gardens, uh, for, I'm sorry, for containers. Um, you still need a pretty considerable size pot to grow tomatoes uh, in a container, but it, it does work very well. You, when you, you're gonna use a soilless mix, so you're, when you're using a soilless mix, you're, you have to note that soilless mix is, you're not gonna get the micronutrients that you would normally get from soil. So you definitely have to fertilize weekly. And the one thing about pots is um, they do dry out fairly quickly, especially clay pots. Clay pots dry very quickly. So you're gonna need to really uh, water them each day in the hot weather. And maybe um, if we have a pretty hot summer, you might even have to water them twice a day. Again, you want to water at the base of the, the plant directly at the roots. So you want to, again, use a soilless mix. It should say uh, potting mix for containers or container mix, something like that. Um, some that are really good as pro mix or this um, sunshine professional growth mix. You want to, uh, it's very, very fluffy. Uh, it, it has a lot more uh, nutrients in it. I mean, I'm sorry, oxygen and nutrients. And it's a very fluffy blend. It's usually peat moss, cocoa choir. Cocoa choir is the outside shredded part of coconuts. Perlite and vermiculite is for absorbing water and usually has some sand. You want to add some compost to that also uh, for the micro for some microorganisms. Uh, I use a uh, lobster compost. That's a organic compost. You can add some granular for fertilizer to it if you don't want to do a liquid fertilizer. You want to mix that all together. You want to moisten it unless you're buying you know unless you're buying um, a mix, a bag that's already a special mix. You want to mix it all together. You want to moisten that. You want to put that in the pot moist. You want to plant your either your transplants or your seeds, and then you want to keep it watered. Again, garden soil can carry a lot of diseases, and it's really too compact uh, for containers. And we just hope that you have a bumper crop. We hope that you are. Uh, if you follow some of uh, my suggestions, I hope you have a bumper crop. Just a few last slides here. Again, this is the, uh, the hotline is gardener at uri.edu. Because of the um, pandemic, we had to go totally virtually and uh, we started this Learn at Home series. There's about 40 um, YouTube webinars that Master Gardeners and other Cooperative Extension people have done. I have one on the webinar series called Planning a Vegetable Garden. Um, you can also see these. Um, there are, some of them are on Tuesday at, at 7 p.m. and Friday at noon. Um, you can go to YouTube. It's Cooperative Extension. 
the URI Cooperative Extension YouTube channel, or you can find it that also at the uri.edu Master Gardener under Gardening Resources. Uh, there's a there's a container gardening webinar. There's a seed starting webinar. So there's um, a lot of resources that you can access easily and free. The UR, the Master Gardeners URI Cooperative Extension also has a plant clinic. Uh, the woman on the right is Dr. Heather Fulbert. If you have uh, serious problem with uh, diseases, uh, tree diseases, shrubs, uh, any kind of insect, really serious insect problems. Uh, for a small fee, you can send things to the plant clinic. Plant clinic. In that resource guide, there's also um, the Rhode Island Native Plant Guide. We're trying to encourage people to plant as many native plants as possible to keep the butterflies and bees and other pollinators um, happy in the state of Rhode Island. And again, that's another picture of the hotline. You can contact uh, Cooperative Extension. There's the phone number and email. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. All right, and I'm ready for questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'm ready for questions. Um, I had a question about like if you wanted to do an organic garden versus unorganic. So that's what confused me because I thought using like, is it just the pesticide or the fertilizer like that counts it as being organic versus not organic? And do you need to get seedlings that are organic or if you don't get seedlings that are organic, is it still organic? Um, so it, it depends on if you want to be a certified uh, I mean, I'm not a certified organic gardener, but I use organic practices for my own. So um, I do buy my tomato plants at a local uh, garden shop, and I don't know if they're, they're grown organically. The ones that I grow myself, I know I grow organically. Uh, so if you were a certified organic grower, you would have to grow your own seeds organically or buy them organically. Um, so that's the difference. What was the other part of the question? Um, so what confused me is like, what is it? What? So I guess like if you're using pesticides, then it's not organic, like what? Right, so you, yeah, so organic farmers do not use any pesticides. But they can use fertilizers? Yes, they can use fertilizers. Now you can use things like insecticidal soap, which is not a chemical pesticide. So uh, insects um, have openings in their body. So they have a exoskeleton and they have openings in their body where they breathe. And an insecticidal soap, what that'll do is that'll get into that opening and uh, block that. And that's what kills the uh, insect. So there are ways to control insects organically. What is a good way to uh, keep squirrels from digging or farming? Oh, um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, if you, when you find that one out, let me know. Uh, mm -hmm. My master gardener friends tell me, oh, I need to have a dog. Well, <laughs> that that would be great, but my husband is allergic to dogs, so we're not having a dog. But yeah, um, yeah you can try fencing. Uh, squirrels are pretty good at climbing fences, though. So uh, I have not found a good way to keep out. I've st I battle squirrels and rabbits, but mostly rabbits. But yeah, squirrels are pretty hard. They're they they love to dig up, especially bulbs. Yep. They dig up bulbs, they carry off bulbs, they love those. I planted a whole bag of crocus last fall in front of the edging of my, my uh, front lawn and not a single one came up. They came up in the backyard <laughs> under the trees. <laughs> whole, you know, 
a whole mass of things. I said, oh, I didn't plant them there, <laughs> but I have squirrel holes all over the backyard this year. It's the first time ever. <laughs> well, with bulbs, um, what I find is like, if you grow them in pots or like sometimes somebody gives you a pot of tulips, if they've grown once and then plant, you plant those, the squirrels don't seem to bother them. Hmm. Interesting. So, aren't there some bulbs that squirrels don't like daffodils? <clears throat> yeah, they don't bother the daffodils or the hyacinths. But um, they don't seem to like daffodils and hyacinths. But uh, yeah, they are. Uh, tulips yeah. I cannot grow. I know Nadia has tulips. And I'm amazed. <laughs> yes, they were hidden in between the roots of the daffodils. Uh -huh, yeah. I actually also have a question. If um, um, what is the good? Because also I'm just a starting out gardener. What is the good local resource for the garden supplies, uh, heirloom seeds, and what the uh, variety may be very uh, that variety of the cold weather plants now that. We are planting like spinach, lettuce, or beets that uh, does very well in our area and uh, that you would recommend. So right now I have um, lettuce growing mm -hmm. in pots. Uh, mm -hmm. Lettuces definitely can handle it. And, that, and I have it in pots. So like Friday, I, all my pots came in. Mm -hmm. um, so things like Swiss chard is a cold plant. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, kale mm. is also a good one. Uh, beets, radish, you can grow radish, you can easily grow radishes indoors. Uh, Chinese greens, bok choy. Um, I, last year I found some seeds that just said Chinese greens. I have no idea what they all were. It didn't say on the package what they all were, but they were delicious. <laughs> Stir fried. I, I don't know. I've never had seen those plants before. Some of it was bok choy, but then there were other greens in there and they were absolutely wonderful. And I couldn't find those again this year. Where do you go, um, Vivian, to buy your plants? Uh, so I live in Middletown. So when I buy plants, I go to More Blooms, that's in Middletown. Um, and the seeds, uh, I get some from URI and I um, order seeds from Johnny's. It's in Maine. Uh, I find that they have the best yield. So if you plant, you know, if you plant, if you have three seeds, you're going to get three plants. Yeah. So, so you don't have to buy, you don't have to plant six seeds to get three plants. You can plant three seeds and get three plants. <laughs> so what's the email address for Johnny's? You know, I, I don't know. I'd have to look that up. It's uh, Johnny's of Maine. Johnny's Seed Catalog of Maine. Mm -hmm. Sometimes um, I, I've, I'll plant tomatoes. I'll get the plant all grown up from a, a neighborhood place. Um, and at least one of them gets uh, what I, I've heard is called black bottom. What is that? Is, I... is the tomato has a black bottom? Yeah. OK. So yeah, that's black. That that's a that's a calcium deficiency. Mm. So uh, some bone meal mm. in the plant when you plant that, and you also want to make sure that um, you're watering your tomatoes regularly. They not they like they don't like being soaked, but they like being wet, and you want to plant your tomato plants very deep. So you get a little transplant, you know, you want to actually bury that all the way down to the, to the, you want to cut off some of the bottom leaves, cut them, don't rip them, cut them mm -hmm. and uh, plant that plant as deep as you can. Mm -hmm. And uh, tomatoes will grow more roots from the base of the plant and will grow roots from the stem. So you want to bury that plant deep. And uh, that'll give you a, a much, much stronger plant, too. Hmm. I have trouble growing root vegetables. Beets, radishes, they don't, you know, all I see is green. Is it, um, is your soil really compact? I mean, root vegetables need a nice, loose soil. 
Mm, okay. So that means more compost? More compost. Okay. All right. More compost. Yeah. Nice right. loose soil for root vegetables. May and I we ask... have a lot of rocks. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's Rhode Island. We have a lot of rocks. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it amazes me when I, I used to have a really big vegetable garden, like about, uh, um, and I would rototill every year and take out these giant rocks. It's like, where did you come from? I mean, year <laughs> after year, I'm still taking yeah. out rocks. Yeah. Can you Can uh, I ask uh, more question about the soil sampling? Uh, because I'm interested to do it in my garden, but I don't know how many, just one sample from somewhere or a few samples. How does that work? Okay. Um, you can go to that URI dot edu master gardener website and go into soil testing and it'll explain it in detail so mm -hmm. say you've got a vegetable garden if it's a small one four by eight maybe take two sp two scoops full and mix them together and uh, send that in as a sample we only need like a cup of soil to test mm -hmm. um, but if you're doing like your lawn and you have a pretty good sized backyard you might want to take uh, make take soil for maybe three or four places mm -hmm. and then uh, mix those together and send us about a, or take us about a cup. Do you live in Providence? Uh, no, uh, in East Greenwich, but I, I saw the location and I think the Roger Williams is the closest, like more convenient location. Okay. okay. So just take there and drop off. Yes. So, um, yeah, at Roger Williams, it's 10 to 2 on Saturday mornings, and they're there every week, and you can go there. Um, it's at the Botanical Center. Mm -hmm. if, if there were the address, did you get the address? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then it, it's, um, it's contactless. So the forms, and there's uh, forms in there. You fill out the form, and you use it, either use a rubber band around it, put it put the form around your soil sample, leave it in the bin, and a master gardener picks it up at two o'clock, takes them home and, and uh, tests them at home. Mm -hmm. And they'll contact you either email or phone call. Perfect, thank you. Great. Is um, cow manure the same as compost? No, <laughs> um, manure is the, you know, specifically um, animal waste, cow, or in this case, cow waste that um, that has been broken down. And you don't want to use if you if you're going to use manure on your vegetable garden, you want to put it down in the fall because manure can have a lot of other diseases in it, and you want that to really decompose over a winter. So you don't want to use manure. Uh, especially fresh manure, and then, you know, plant your vegetables. You could actually uh, get quite a few diseases or toxins in your vegetables from that. But mm -hmm. it's pretty safe if you, you know, at the end of the season, you've taken all your plants out, you can if you really, you know, some people get manure for free. So it's like, yeah, well, sure, why not? And you can use it. Compost is um, the breakdown of organic nutrients. So I have two compost bins in my yard. Cool. Uh, it's Browns, again, composting is a whole nother talk um, that you could, um, there should be a composting video on um, the webinar too, but I, I give a whole nother compost talk, talk. It's the breakdown of organic material. So it's browns like shredded leaves and greens um, like vegetable cuttings, vegetable scraps and it's a two to one ratio of browns to greens and you put it in a pile or in a bin and that breaks down over time. I, um, can you, like, I can't have a compost pile, um, like, especially leaves, when they decompose, it creates heat and right. rats, I'm in the city, so rats nest in it. Mm. Is there a place I can get compost or? Um, yeah, I mean, you can buy compost. Sure, you can you can buy compost. Um, again, I use lot. I it, when I had a bigger vegetable, I create my own compost. But when I have a bigger vegetable garden, I use lobster compost of Maine. So you mm. can buy that actually in a bag. Oh, 
Okay. Um, yep. I, for the, um, on when you're talking about yields, uh, what plants can yield or whatnot. So the seeds that I'm handing out to everybody who's participating, um, they are, um, the rescue seeds that you guys had from last year that okay. I'm having. So should they plant like twice as much so that they get a good yield or do they so, not eat much? Do you know what year they say? What's the year on the back? I believe it said 2000. 2020, 11, 2000, uh, package. Okay, so they're only a year old. They're only a year old. They should be a pretty good yield at a year old. When they're, you know, when you're getting older seeds, like three, four years of an old, sometimes I we recommend like just trying to like scar them a little bit with a knife or something just to get them or germinate them, start germinate them first and then plant them. There's a ways to get around that to use older seeds. But one year is you know, they should be okay. Okay, thank you. So you soak it in water before planting, that's how you, I germinate. Yeah, yeah, or put them between two moist paper towels to just get them started, just keep them moist and get them started that way, put them in a warm place or in a sunny window just to get them started and then plant them. I've never heard of scarring, what's that? Um, so take a bean seed, for instance, a bean seed, I mean, you can't do it with a lettuce seed. Lettuce seeds are so tiny, but a bean seed, um, if a bean seed is like four or five years old, you can actually take a, a, a knife or a, a, a pin or something and just store, like scar, like scrape the seed coat and that would uh, help it to germinate. Again, you want, would use warm paper towel, paper towels, put them in a warm area, because to, ger to get germinate seeds, you need moisture and warmth. Interesting, thank you. Um, and then I also had a question you were talking about with the zoning for trees. So like how far away from a tree should we um, plant? Well, it kind of depends on how big the tree is. Is the tree huge and has really sprouting, spreading roots. So the width usually depends on the tree, but usually the spread of the roots is equal to the drip line of the tree. Hmm. Wow. Does that make sense? So if you have a tree with a canopy that runs whatever, 30 feet, that's going to be the drip line. And that's usually where the roots end. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, so we would plant it outside that drip line. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear that. So you would plant it outside that drip line then? Yes. Okay. It's just for competition. You don't want to be, um, you know, you having trying to grow vegetables and the tree roots are also taking the nutrients and the uh, water. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask because there was some uh, seed starting uh, webinars mentioned. Are those recorded or it's also live session? It's a, a recording. So uh, again, you can go to um, the U URI Cooperative Extension YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Or in that uh, page with the resources, it has those. Let me go back to this. Let me go back. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is the learn at home series. So mm -hmm. you go this bottom website, gardening resources under those uh, under resources, you can connect right there to the learn at home webinar series. And, um, the, actually the seed starting one is, is really good. It's Sue Scotty. She is the, um, she does all the seed starting and is in the director of the East Farm um, at URI, the East Farm Vegetable and, and Perennial Gardens. So she's in charge there. Um, she's been a master gardener a long time and she's the, the queen of seed starting. <laughs> she has actually a two part video on there on seed starting and transplanting seeds. 
Um, also, that's you. Uh, one more question. I apologize. Um, no, you that's fine. I'm here until you. I want to answer all your questions. Uh, you mentioned the um, what is was the frost frost cloth or something like that. Where you uh, where you can get that something like that? Because I have uh, my plants covered with a plastic, but it doesn't um, it doesn't let through water. But I know there's some cloths like that that they do other than internet is is there somewhere locally to buy those supplies um i don't know gotcha. I, I really i really don't know um i've never seen it at like a home depot or a lowe's or anything like that or a walmart but maybe maybe <laughs> some bigger gardening supply stores um I'll look. I, like, really I'll find it. it. <laughs> I live on Aquidneck Island. I can't really think of any place on Aquidneck Island that would have it. Mm -hmm. What's it called? It's a frost cloth. Frost cloth. Probably can. Um, I mean, the internet, you can definitely buy it. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a really good place in Vermont called Gardener Supply. Um, I've bought several things there. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes, I think you answered all my questions. So okay. Ready. And That's again, uh, utilize the hotline. We're there Monday through Friday. Utilize the hotline if you have any other questions. Uh, we try our best to answer them all. And when <laughs> we don't very know, much. we don't Thank know, we'll pass them on to the URI professors and say, we got this one tough question. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we're a team of about uh, doing, whole, doing uh, emails at home. We're a team of about 15 of us and we, on Monday through Friday. And if we don't know, if between the 15 of us, we certainly can pass it on to a URI professor that can answer your question. Mm. Great. Thank you for such a great resource. Mm. Thank you so much. Yes, definitely. It was very nice, Vivian. Thank you. Thank you for being with us, Vivian. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, yeah, check out those webinars, use the resources, use the hotline, and uh, happy gardening, everybody. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Nice to meet you all. Thank you.